Welcome to Coastal Front. Join us each week as we sit down with the movers and shakers of Vancouver to discuss stories of business, politics, accomplishment, and failure. Our aim is to keep you dialed into what matters most in our city. Now, here's your host, Andrew Johns. Great. Okay. Well, I'm so excited to have you here today, Sean. We have uh, Sean Baxter. You're the manager of Marine Operations and Assistant Harbor Master. Is that correct? That is correct. <laughs> okay. Yes. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks for coming to Coastal Front today as we talk about what some, something that's most important about our coast here, which is Vancouver, the Vancouver Port, and Vancouver, uh, the Port Authority. Um, so I understand you started off as a Coast Guard and over the last uh, nine years, you've worked your way up through the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority. And as we mentioned, you're now the Marine Operations and Assistant Harbor Master. And you were also recently um, uh, announced as being one of Vancouver Board of Trade's young professionals uh, in their success st- series. Is that right? Uh, that is correct. I was a part of the signature program at the Greater Vancouver Board of Trade. That's yeah. right. Yeah, oh, good for you. Yeah. Well, this is this is neat. Well, we're going to have a lot of good content to go over here in this very short time that we're chatting about Vancouver Port. Now, there's more than just one port in Vancouver, isn't that right? That is correct. Yeah. Uh, in the sense that there are a number of different geographical areas that right. we manage, all under the one umbrella as the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority. Yeah. So in 2008, there were several ports: uh, the Fraser Port Authority, the North Fraser Port Authority, and the Vancouver Port Authority that all amalgamated under the direction of the Minister of Transportation. Okay. And at that time, we took on uh, uh, operating all three of those jurisdictions under one umbrella. Okay. Now, is the uh, is that Roberts Bank Coal Terminal area, is that part of your jurisdiction too? It is. It yes. is. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So the three geographical areas that I reference are yeah. one, Burrard Inlet, and that's everywhere uh, east of Point Atkinson up through Burrard Inlet to, towards Port Moody, uh, up Indian Arm. Yeah. And then the Fraser River as well. And that includes the north arm, uh, what we refer to as the main or south arms of the Fraser River, uh, even up into the Pitt River uh, and east towards Maple Ridge. Wow. And then the other th- and third and final area is what you mentioned, uh, Roberts Bank. And that area includes uh, West Shore uh, Coal Terminal, also Delta Port, which is Canada's largest container terminal. Canada's largest container terminal. That's right. Wow, even bigger than what we might have out in St. Lawrence, uh, in uh, Montreal, and our sorry, in Ottawa, I guess it would be. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah wow, that's, that's correct. Oh, great. So, uh, can you talk for a moment, minute about like I don't know if you know these numbers, but just like how many ships, how many boats do we have floating around in the port? What kind of volume? I mean, you, you got to you yeah. you and your team oversee a substantial amount of infrastructure and and assets floating around people and ships and all sorts of things on those ships. What, can you get yeah. talk to some of those numbers? Yeah, I can speak to, you know, at a high level, yeah. uh, some of the, the the impact that the Port of Vancouver brings to the region, uh, as well as Canada. We often refer to ourselves as Canada's port, uh, here positioned in the Asia Pacific Gateway, and we certainly are that. Uh, we're trading over 140 million tons annually, um, and roughly, uh, I believe, off the top of my head, about 110 million of that is international tonnage. So, uh, tonnage is this just weight? Are we talking about pure weight? That, that's right. Okay. Yeah, and there are some certain uh, allowances. You know, obviously with containers, we measure a TU and a certain uh, uh, formula. Yeah, uh, which is consistent with other with with other ports and things like uh, passenger volumes as well. Obviously, you, you're not measuring the weight of each each and every passenger coming along. So mm. um, that really speaks to the diversification of our port and the fact that we uh, trade across five major cargo sectors. So we uh, classify those as container, cruise, bulk, break bulk, and roll on roll off. So. Uh, when I say that, that's kind of automobiles being imported into Canada. Wow. That's not to mention the uh, d- domestic cargo sector. So uh, of that 140 million tons, uh, there's roughly 30 million tons that is traded domestically in, in and around the port region. Wow. Wow. Incredible. Well, let me ask you some pointed questions, Sean, about the types of things as someone who's not in the port, you know, and not in the shipping business, um, but observing from a distance different types of ships. And you tell me if you guys oversee these groups. So container ships, do you guys oversee yes, that? Sir? That's correct. How about cruise ships? Yes. What about like uh, 
fishing boats that like commercial fishing boats yes uh, so those would fall under the category of our domestic users okay and uh while they're in the port's waters yeah uh they're under the navigational jurisdiction of a port authority okay that's correct what about um you see like these tugboats with these big booms of logs that mm -hmm. have been uh yeah what, what are those yeah certainly they fall into the domestic user group as well yeah. and um it, whether they're going up the fraser river or up to port moody where there's still a log handling facility they're under the jurisdiction of the port as well okay what about submarines submarines good one <laughs> um i think it's it's been a, a couple of years since we've had a submarine have we and ever had a submarine yeah in the, waters? I, I, I don't know how top secret this is but there were certainly submarines in the port during uh the olympic games yeah uh, for security reasons oh really um and yeah. since then I, I i it's certainly a rare occurrence but it does happen yeah yes. yeah wow yeah. um so who owns the vancouver port authority yeah, we are an agent that operates uh, on behalf of the federal government. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, we report to the Minister of Transportation. We're yep. given our letters patent, so basically our directions and the, the federal lands that we manage on behalf of the federal government directly from that agency. Okay. Uh, so really the port itself and those federal lands are a Canadian asset, um, and we're operating them on behalf of the federal government. Okay, great. All right, well, let's, let's, this is great, Sean. This is a good introduction and overview of what the Vancouver Port Authority does. And, and now let's dive into a few different uh, topics. I want to start by talking about uh, what visually a lot of us see, which is these massive containers that are being, I don't know if they're, most of them are being unloaded or offloaded, or maybe there's a mix. But we've got those big cranes down there past, uh, you know, Railtown, Gastown. Yes. And they're so impressive to see. I'd love to see them up front, up close one day. And then, of course, now that seems to be just as big over in the Roberts Bank area that uh, we talked about earlier. Can you maybe start by talking about those kind of ships? Those are called container ships, That's right? That's right, and yeah, container ships. Yeah. And you mentioned, uh, you know, are they coming or going? Yeah. And, and uh, that's yeah. a great question. I think, you know, really high level numbers, uh, about half of the containers are being imported into Canada. Okay. Um, another quarter of those are being exported and maybe another quarter of those, maybe not as generous, are empty containers that are being repositioned back to uh, different trading areas. Okay. Uh, but we certainly see uh, a lot of uh, growth. Uh, and a lot of uh, uh, ships that are coming in, con container ships predominantly, and that's uh, a trend that's really uh, taken shape over the, uh, the last uh, uh, century almost, where as a lot of cargo is being transitioned into the form of containers just for ease of transport ultimately, uh, even to the point where Canada is exporting grain through uh, uh, containers as well. So we do have some facilities nowadays that load grain into containers. But uh, for, for the most part, it's it's your typical household goods that are coming through mm. uh, containers and uh, like blenders and iPhones and everything in yeah. between. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, um, anything that you see on on the store shelves nowadays. Wow. Um, these container ships, um, do you have any idea of like, like how much they can carry? Like, is there some, yeah, there's some standard, uh, uh, definitions for carrying capacity for container ships. And uh -huh. that's broken down into what we call a TEU or 20 foot equivalent. So each one of those containers that, uh, you'll see in the yard or on the ship, or even being hauled around on a train or uh, truck chassis along the, around the lower mainland. Uh, most of those typically are 20 foot long. You do see some that are 40 feet and uh, some even a bit longer, but the standard uh, 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 measure is 20 foot. So um, our port, uh, uh, much like a lot of other ships uh, that come into the port over time has really increased. So the number of ships that come into the port has, has remained relatively static uh, over the last decade. We see roughly 3,200 ships foreign arrivals every year and of that uh, around 800 of those are container ships and um, mm. uh, it's it's certainly uh, when you look out the window you, you may think that there's a lot more of these ships coming and going than there ever has been before but certainly the trend that that we've seen is the carrying capacity of these ships has increased over the last decade so oh. what we would typically see a, a ship capable of carrying perhaps three to four thousand TEUs now can carry quite easily uh, 13 to 15,000 TEUs. That much more. That's right. 
And well, what's what's been the catalyst that's changed that? There's a huge increase. Yes, uh, uh, certainly there's a, a drive to uh, you know just bigger ships, the economy of scale for mm. for a lot of our carriers. There's been a lot of consolidation in in the industry, um, but also the as I mentioned before, just the the, the trend towards containerized cargo. So mm. you're seeing a lot of different forms of uh, cargos being traded onto container ships nowadays, where in previous years they were not. Mm. Sean, is there a way for someone like myself or Ross who don't know this industry very well, when we're looking out in the waters of English Bay and we, we're looking at these different ships, how can we tell if it's an oil and oil tanker yeah. or it's a container ship or a logging, like a it's carrying lumber, or I don't even know what other types of ships there are carrying grains. Is there an easy way to tell? Yes, there certainly is. Um, there's a few uh, public uh, resources that you can use, not to mention uh, an app that the Port uh, of Vancouver, the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority has. Yeah. It's called the Port Van eHub app. And oh. on there you can, uh, as, as I mentioned, free to download and, and you can go on to our maps and resources there and you can view the ships that are in the port, the different types. Yeah. Uh, you can click on an icon and you can you see the type of ship that they are. Uh, yeah, I found one of these that, called a, one I've used is called Vessel Finder. That's right, and yeah. it's so interesting. Yeah. It even it, it even shows you the, the the period of time over how they've been moved, and you can see almost how every one of these circles around them because they're, I guess, the tides move them from one direction to the other. That's right. Yeah, yeah. and this this is uh, the reason why that information is public and free. It's transmitted over what we call AIS, automatic identification system, and that's a, a system that's broadcast over VHF. Okay. A radio frequency. And, really? And the purpose of it is is for marine safety. So mm. it lets other users, port users, uh, mariners alike, see the position of other ships. Uh, uh, a good example of that is if you are a recreational boater and you're coming or going out of First Narrows and you may not have some of the equipment that a commercial vessel has, but you could use a resource like that to see vessels that are approaching a, a blind corner or whatnot and, and increase your awareness of what's moving in the waterway. Yeah. So, but it also has the, good, the, the purpose of letting uh, those that are interested in what's going on in the port see the different types of ships that are, that are uh, in the port at any given time. Yeah, okay. Well, that's really helpful. So do we have that uh, up there, Ross? With the, what was the app called one more time? Wait, here it is, eHub app. That's right. Under the uh, Van port of, uh, portvancouver.com website. That's, I'm gonna check that out. Um, one of my one of my buddies that I play hockey with, he's a tugboat uh, driver, and he was telling me that actually, mo and tell me if this is correct, if I recall, the majority of the ships or none of the ships that you'll typically see in English Bay will be oil tankers because they're actually ha they're actually ha uh, kept kind of south of Vancouver, the tip of Vancouver Island until they're brought in, um, and then they're brought in to do whatever they I guess to fill up on oil mm -hmm. and then head back out to the waters. But they don't sit in English Bay. Is that correct? Uh, not, not necessarily. Oh, the, okay. uh, tankers do use our anchorage areas yeah. uh, for for different reasons. Uh, typically, with with those uh, that cargo sector, much like container and cruise ships, uh, their their performance and and the fact that they time their arrival. Uh, to go right alongside berth is more, more common than uh, having to wait for an anchorage. But there is reasons, you know, due to weather. Uh, we do have restrictions in the port on when, when you can access certain areas if re visibility is restricted due to things like uh, fog or snow even. Um, so the, those would be reasons why you may see them anchored or, or just waiting to get into port. Can I tell the difference just visually on what a oil tanker looks like versus a container um, car carrier? To the well-trained eye, you can quite quite quickly. I'm not well-trained. Uh, <laughs> we do have you a said, resource you have this on our here. website. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And that, that is a, a good image that, that helps. Uh, Where'd you find this, Ross? It's just right on types of ships on oh, their website. Types of ships on the Port Vancouver website. Yeah. So what would what's an again it doesn't doesn't say the word oil oh I see tankers mm -hmm. there for oil gasoline okay which yeah, yeah. so okay I, that's helpful that's that this gives you a visual you know a cruise ship wouldn't be an obvious one but uh, yeah I think I think you know a general rule of thumb is yeah. uh, bulk carriers of which tankers are uh, considered uh, in that family yeah uh, there those are types of vessels that are designed to carry most of the uh, cargo in large holds within the ship. 
So when uh, a cargo of that nature is being loaded onto the ship, it uh, it stores most of it under the water. So the, the those vessels are deeper than you would see typically um, a container or a cruise ship, which visually is storing a lot of that cargo above the water line, right. for example. Right. Yeah. Sean, is it true that when you see these ships and you see that kind of red line with a big ball at the front, that that, that the big bulb there, that, that that means it's probably not full? And that when that's they're right. full, okay. Yeah, that's yeah. that's another good way visually with bulk carriers and even tankers, you, you can see uh, right away if they're sitting out of the water, they're very in a light condition, we call it, Yeah. Uh, unloaded. And when they are loaded, you'll see them almost uh, at times can look to be very close to the water line and they're loaded right up to their draft marks we call it and and th those are uh, draft marks uh, and load lines are are things that are really established as an international practice so that ships know the maximum volume that they can carry okay yeah. gotcha uh, this summer we took our team out on a team event rented i think like 21 uh jet skis and went zipping around out there. You know, we, we, we should talk about safety because maybe some of my staff could listen to this <laughs> podcast after we we were ripping around those. Those ships are enormous. They really are. And the wake that they can make, there was a cruise ship that was leaving and we were doing jumps off the back of the wake. I don't know if I should be telling you this or not, but uh, <laughs> we were doing jumps off the back of the wake of these cruise ships and it's just insane. Mm -hmm. do, do, is there, is there, um, are there a lot of, what you call it, pleasure craft, right? That'd be. Are there a lot of pr pleasure craft uh, through the course of a year that end up toppling or having problems because their operators are just not paying attention and they and forget about getting smoked by a boat, yeah. just by getting rocked by a, by a huge wake? Is that common? We see a, a range of different types of occurrences that happen over the course of the year. Uh, it's typically seasonal. Most yeah. of the recreational activity. As I would imagine, you're out uh, on the jet ski was in the summertime. That's right. Yeah. So certainly we see a lot of those types of occurrences happening uh, throughout the summertime. We have uh, a campaign and we spend a lot of time educating port users on, on safe boating practices. And, and we spend a lot of that time focusing on the interaction between commercial traffic and recreational traffic. Right. Uh, as the city grows, uh, certainly so do the opportunities to get out and enjoy the water. And uh, we believe that can happen safely with, uh, with enough education. Yeah, okay, well, that's, that's good. Now there were some, uh, I believe I saw this summer on on Twitter, some people posting pictures of some orca whales that got right into the harbor. Is That's that right? right? That's Can you right. talk about that? That was kind of neat. Yes, uh, it's not a rare occurrence. Uh, we, oh, okay. we do see, uh, uh, may maybe not to, with that level of frequency. I think the same pod came in uh, four or five times over the course of two weeks as they. And where which found. so where, which part just so people know visually which part of the uh, port were they into? Did yeah, they, they came right through the first narrows, okay, under the so landscape under bridge, Landry's bridge, okay, yeah, through the inner harbor, through the second narrows, really? Iron Workers Bridge, and uh, up in I think their final destination was near Deep Cove. So many uh, many listeners may know that area, yeah. uh, for recreational reasons and. My understanding from our, our environmental specialists that work at the port that they had found some some prey up there, uh, I believe seals, sea lions, and and whatnot, and they uh, found uh, enough of a reason to come back several times. Uh, we <laughs> do have awesome. whales in the harbor from time to time, and uh, it's certainly something that we have to be prepared for as well. Yeah, what is the general rule? when there are whales or orca around? Is there any kind of rules around navigation there? Yes, there is minimum distances that okay. uh, legally all mariners, including commercial traffic, recreational traffic, are required to maintain. So a good rule of thumb uh, is 200 meters. Okay. Uh, obviously, in the confines of the harbor, it may be difficult at times to, to, to do that. But at, generally, as, as I was saying, if you're uh, reducing all your engine, uh, turning off your engine, and basically just drifting, that's a good practice uh, if you do see uh, encounter wildlife on the water. Right. Okay. If it's safe to do so, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, well, let's let's jump to the topic that I kind of alluded to earlier, which is about oil tankers. Now, this is a real hot topic these days. It has been for a couple, quite a few years now, which is the uh, potential expansion of the um, Kinder Morgan, or now I think they call it, just call it TMX mm -hmm. pipeline, and what impact it would have on traffic in the port and whatnot. Um, can you speak to this as far as from the perspective of the port authority of like you know, do, do you guys oversee the um, like like you know when it comes to like safety of uh, 
the environment to making sure that oil isn't spilled into the, our, our beautiful, pristine waters we have here in BC. Is that something that you guys oversee? Our, our mandate is uh, to facilitate Canada's trade objectives yep. through, through the Port of Vancouver. Uh, we have to do that in a, in a manner that's uh, safe and efficient while observing environmental protection and the needs of local communities. Uh, so certainly when you, when you speak to expanding uh, an operation uh, such as bringing oil tankers into the port, we do play a role. Um, uh, those vessels have called the port now uh, for, for the, uh, just over 10 years, that, that size of vessel that's consistent with this project. Uh, and they have done so in a safe manner. And there's no reason to, to, to think that they can't continue to do that. Okay. So when you say that size of vessel, so look, the, the TMX pipeline was built many years ago, more than 10 years ago. Um, and there's, there, I think what a lot of uh, local Vancouverites don't realize is that, that uh, we've been exporting safely, from what I understand, uh, oil off the shores of, I think it's finished, it finalizes in... Uh, it's not Burnaby, is it? Is it or is it uh, Port Coquitlam? Or what's what's the uh, community where they have uh, they they um, on, on load this oil onto the tankers? Yeah, is the it? the Westridge Marine Terminal, as yeah. it's referred to, is located in the uh, uh, municipality of Burnaby. Oh, Bur- maybe in yes. Burnaby. Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, here it is, Westridge Westridge Marine Terminal. Um, am I correct in saying this has been going on for far more than just ten years? That is correct. Yeah, yeah but you're referring to a specific size of. That's correct. Ship. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the port sees about 250 tankers uh, coming into the port every year. Oil Oops. tankers. Oil tankers. Okay. Uh, uh, and they may be carrying different products ranging from canola oil uh, to diesel and other types of uh, f- fuels. Yes. Um, now, the type of tanker that is consistent with the TMX project is referred to as Aframax tanker. And there is a number of different terms for tankers internationally, right? And uh, Aframax is certainly what we would refer to as a mid-range tanker. Uh, there are larger ones that w- we typically would never see calling our port. Okay. Um, is there a certain size of tanker that can't make it through underneath the, uh, like, is there, do they get too big and you just can't fit through the uh, Lionsgate Bridge? Yeah. Well, and when we refer to our role, uh, yeah. our role is, again, to, to look at the safe and efficient navigation of these vessels coming to and from the port. and. That includes container ships and cruise ships as well. Yeah. Uh, we have to look at the physical constraints. Uh, our role is really to, to help develop this marine infrastructure, and that includes navigation channels. So when we look at a navigation channel, and if we use the second arrows as an example where these tankers are uh, going into and out of, we have to consider the depth of water. We have to consider any other physical obstructions that are in that area. and. There are two bridges, a highway bridge, a rail bridge. So when we're designing a channel to go through that area, we have to consider those physical constraints. And and, uh, in the case of the second arrows, there's a width consideration and there's a depth consideration. So the Aframax size vessel is uh, is the standard, uh, is your largest vessel that you would likely see going through that area for uh, Okay, and we've got an image of them here. Is this an Aframax? uh, tanker, it looks like. Um, that's right. Yeah. Sean, c- can you describe, um, again, in layman's terms, what a tanker of this like this type looks like? I'm assuming it's double-hauled, is it? And and maybe you can even, in layman's terms, explain yeah. what that means? Yeah, double-hauled is, uh, is an industry standard now, an oh, okay. international requirement. Um, and that what that means is uh, uh, there's basically two hulls. So you would have your a steel hull and then there's an outer frame that separates it in in a double bottom fashion so uh, there's basically two layers uh, to the ship's bottom so that if it were to run aground or uh, suffer a collision uh, incident it, it's unlikely that the cargo tanks would would be pierced through both hulls that's correct gotcha um, now to talk about um, your role in the possibility of say an oil spill or a um some kind of pretty unusual event like a a, a 
tank tanker ship like this crashing or tipping mm -hmm. um where where do you where does your role start and where does it end mm -hmm. as far as the port authority yeah so as i mentioned uh, under our mandate uh, is the safe and efficient movement of these vessels so we yeah. focus uh, our efforts into ensuring that there's adequate infrastructure for these vessels to come into and out of the port yeah uh, specifically our navigation channels we focus a lot of time on ensuring there's uh, uh, best practices and procedures in place to move these vessels uh, safely and efficiently through areas like the second arrow so mm -hmm. uh, the second arrows is a waterway that, that that can be challenging to navigate at certain times uh, not can you explain a, why yeah it's not unlike a river uh, okay. for for much of the day where the current whether the water's coming into or out of the port uh, can create currents in excess of five knots so typically even if you're in a recreational vessel or even a large uh, tanker as it were, it's, it's uh, treacherous to navigate through that area under those conditions, mm -hmm. which is why we require, and it's most safe to transit those areas at slack water when there is no water movement through uh, the second arrows. Okay, so slack water refers to the time in which the tide is not going out or coming in, but you're right in between kind of thing? That's correct. And, okay. and we have about uh, three or four times during the day okay. uh, on average in our port where we have slack waters and uh, certainly with the trend to, towards larger vessels, um, our port is becoming very much, uh, 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 the movement of vessels is becoming very much determined by these slack waters. I see. Yeah. Is there almost, is that almost like in a sense because there's only happening three times a day or so, is that becoming a bit of a bottleneck for you guys as far as how much, uh, how many vessels you can get in and out of the harbor? Is that becoming a challenge for you? Yeah, it'll certainly, uh, it presents a challenge. There's a lot yeah. of different port users out there. Um, and when we, even uh, beyond what we see on the water, so we see, you know, deep sea vessels on the water, uh, domestic vessels, tug and barges, as you mentioned, right, right through to log tows, recreational vessels, they all want the opportunity to to use the waterway. Uh, in the second arrows, again, there's a u uniqueness that there's also a rail bridge in that area too. So anytime a vessel is going through, that rail bridge is raised in the in the upward position, meaning a train can't go through. So yeah. uh, there's a lot of competing uses in, in that area. And uh, our role is to ensure that we uh, create an environment that those all those users can use the port efficiently mm. and safely. And Sean, um, if there was an oil spill, let's say one of these tankers did have an oil spill, is it under the responsibility of the Port Authority to uh, act quickly to deal with the, minimizing the, the environmental impact of that, or does that fall into somebody else's jurisdiction? Our role in an incident, if it were to occur, is to, first and foremost to support those agencies whose mandate it is uh, to provide incident response. And what agencies would those be, do you know? Well, if you're referring to a pollution incident, it's the Canadian Coast Guard Environmental Response. It would be a lead agency in all Canadian waters okay. uh, for matters related mm -hmm. to that. They um, use the support of uh, certified response organizations. Uh, for those that have kept a close eye on the media, there's been a lot of talk of uh, WCMRC or Western Canadian Marine Response Corporation, and they have a lot of uh, infrastructure in place um, as a contractor to uh, to help with these types of incidents. Is that a private company? Uh, they are a yeah. company that is set up uh, with a managing board uh, by the users. So typically, oh. see oil handling facilities and other uh, uh, vessel operators controlling uh, the operation of that company. I see. Is there um, a public documents or um, sort of a um, history of when when events have occurred, whether it's an oil spill or just even a collision? Like, do you, do you, could I, as a regular, t you know, voter taxpayer, be able to go on to some website and be able to see where there's been incidences? So similar to like, for example, the Van I'll give you an analogy like the Vancouver Police Department keeps a log publicly available to everybody on where break and enters are happening. Um, is that something that's available to the average person? Yeah, there is a, a number of different agencies that do publish this type of information. Yeah. Um, certainly the Canadian Coast Guard, uh, Transport Canada would have some uh, some references to uh, historical incidents that have occurred. Yeah. Also, I'm aware of the provincial government as well has uh, some statistics uh, uh, and, and records of, of previous incidents. Yeah, okay. What about these cruise ships? That's a that's a becoming a pretty big business for our city, isn't it? It's uh, certainly a, a growing industry yeah. uh, in more ways than one. Yeah. Um, uh, from an operational perspective, we're seeing 
uh, a lot of the cruise ships that are calling the port growing in size. Yeah. And that's speaking uh, to the demand uh, for um, tourism, uh, both in the city and up through um, uh, the waters of BC and into Alaska. Yeah. Um, is the port run for these large ships? I mean, if you're a small pleasure craft, you kind of just bounce around whatever you want, I guess, um, for better or for worse. But just like, I guess, you have a um, like YVR, like the Vancouver Airport Authority, and they have a control tower, and they get to decide, and thankfully, you know, um, who's landing and who's taking off at different times to make sure there's no collisions. Um, do, do you guys have a kind of an equivalent to like a, like a control tower for the ports to ensure that ships like you know if there's a like there's no kind of game of chicken between a, an oil tanker and a cruise ship as they're both heading in different directions under the Lionsgate Bridge? Yes there certainly is and uh, we're very fortunate in Canada to have a, a consistent service that's provided by the Canadian Coast Guard okay uh, across the country and in all waters uh, so the equivalent of what you would call air traffic control is, is referred to as vessel traffic services and that's provided uh, in Canada by the Canadian Coast Guard. And okay. so all the movements of commercial traffic um, are broadcast over uh, traffic channels. And we certainly encourage uh, all users on the waterway, um, even if they're not legally required to do so, to monitor and observe uh, the traffic that's happening on uh that is being broadcast over those channels. Okay, well, that's a good safety plug. So, Sean, mm -hmm. what what channel would that be? Yes, uh, well, it, as I was mentioning, there's different port areas. So yeah. if you're in English Bay or through the harbor here, it's uh, Channel 12. Okay. Uh, if you're in the Fraser River, it's uh, VHF Channel 74. And if you're out at Roberts Bank, uh, it's Channel 11. Okay, well, that's great. Um, let's talk for a minute about um, port security. I... Um, I remember when I used to go to the Cannery restaurant. I don't know, you, may, you seem like a younger guy, so I don't know if you remember that restaurant or not, but it was a phenomenal restaurant. Um, and you, but it was, it was, you know, you had to drive along all the roads to pass the port there, the Vancouver port. They shut down, sadly, but, uh, and I, and I remember, I, I almost wonder if part of the reason it shut down was because this uh, huge increase that started happening with mm -hmm. the uh, uh, security. Like, you used to be able to just drive out there and nobody asked any questions, but now it's quite, there's a lot of security, probably for good reason. Can you talk for a minute about how security works and you know and why that's important? And mm -hmm. if you can speak to that topic, that'd be helpful. Yeah, um, uh, I think in the last couple decades, port security has certainly evolved to the point, and there are requirements both on port authorities from a from a national level, but also there's international best practices that that ports recognize now, and uh, one of those is really that. Port lands and public lands, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> in some cases, when you when you refer to places like the cannery, have to be separated, and uh, so those are separated so that we can uh, port authorities can control access to to those individuals that are coming and going from port lands. And typically, if you have business on, on in the port or a terminal or uh, as a service provider, uh, you can be sponsored and, and gain access to port uh, through our port pass program. Uh, but really, the purpose of that is is to ensure the security of these uh, federal uh, assets and, and and to ensure security throughout the supply chain. Right. Um, okay. Well, on that topic of security, let's talk about um, another hot topic, which is uh, fentanyl. And there's a lot of um, you know views that there's strong views that the fentanyl that's coming into our city and unfortunately devastating a lot of lives is being sourced from overseas, coming from China, whatnot. And that it's logically coming through the port, not through the, uh, uh, you know, not through air traffic. Um, uh, is this an area that you guys also like oversee as far as like ensuring that there's a, you know, minimal amount of uh, illicit drug activity, human smuggling? I know is another you know big thing, but of course these are all legal activities, so there's not really not a ton of data out there. It's not mm -hmm. like people are voluntarily telling the CRA as to how many people they're smuggling or drugs are smuggling. But can you speak to that for a moment? Um, I can speak to the the mandate of the port yeah. uh, in, in terms of our responsibility uh, uh, under the Canada Marine Act to facilitate Canada's trade objectives yeah. to do so in a safe and efficient manner. Yeah. Uh, and, and certainly uh, the fact that we support agencies that have a mandate to uh, ensure that uh, both criminal activity or goods that are entering Canada um, uh, are observed and, and uh, mitigated against. Uh, so we do certainly... Uh, so you guys wouldn't oversee that then yourselves? I mean, as far as like, 
you don't have uh, like uh, people on on staff that have handcuffs and guns that are gonna go in and check out. I mean, that's not your area, is that right? That's correct. This is yeah. not our area. Uh, policing in in Canada and in the port environment as well is done by police with local jurisdiction. Right. And uh, our, our port uh, uh, overlaps the jurisdiction of 16 different municipalities. So uh, there 16, are a really? number of different agencies that do have uh, responsibility in that respect. Yeah. Wow. So you guys really have a lot of different stakeholders that you have to kind of work with, hey? Have you ever ran that number to figure out how, how many different, I mean, just 16 municipalities alone, you've got um, the Coast Guard. Like it, it seems like a, it's a lot to manage. It, it certainly can be at times. And yeah. uh, uh, we do have good guiding legislation that, uh, that makes our mandate uh, clear to us and helps guide us in, in those relationships. Yeah. Uh, on the water side, we are certainly a very diverse port and right through from commercial users to recreational users, uh, everyone's vying for an opportunity to use the water, whether it's uh, for tr transit services, uh, bridges, tunnels, and other infrastructure and utilities. Yeah. There's often uh, there's there's not often a project in Vancouver uh, that doesn't touch the water in some ways. So um, we're certainly provided with a legis uh, uh, guiding mandate to collaborate with agencies, and we wouldn't get very far if we if we didn't have that as a core principle. So it takes a, a, a lot of effort in terms of maintaining relationships and, and considering the needs of the different users to, to manage a port of the scale. Yeah, okay. Well, Sean, we're almost done here. I gotta, I gotta ask you, so during the uh, celebration of light, when they have the big fireworks, do you get special access to have, like premier viewing because of your uh, your role in the Port Authority? We have a, a team that works really hard to, to, to ensure that that event goes off safely every year. And yeah. it certainly is a challenging one. Uh, our Harbor Patrol, um, our, our team that works on the water every day, plays a key role in, in uh, managing vessel traffic on those nights. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of users out on the waterway. If you've ever been out, uh, yeah, it's you, incredible. you'll know that um, it can be challenging. We're dealing with a lot of people that don't normally typically uh, navigate a vessel at yeah. night yeah, under sure. those circumstances. So last year we restricted vessel traffic, commercial vessel traffic from moving through the port in the hours after the fireworks, just to ensure that uh, to help that make sure that everyone got home safely. Yeah. Um, I've certainly had the chance to uh, view the fireworks from the water and it's an experience like none other. So uh, it's an event that hopefully will be around for years to come. Yeah, well, that's great. Um, as far as a, a message you might want to leave with the listeners who are listening to this, as far as uh, you know, safety is concerned, because I know that's something you, you did mention we'd like to talk about. We have touched on it already, but is there any kind of common practices or things that y you as someone who's obviously I mean this title of assistant harbor master I mean that's mm -hmm. a heck of a title by the way like do, does anybody ever say to you what does that mean and how do you answer that question I do yeah I do get that a lot and yeah. um, when asked that question I often say it's it's part of my role uh, to ensure that every all the port users uh, are, are using the port safely yeah um, our, our job basically is to ensure that the port's a safe place for everyone uh, yeah. to, to, to work in and yeah. uh, enjoy as well. So for that person who's listening who maybe isn't, uh, maybe someone like Ross who's going to rent a jet ski and, and do jumps off the back of a cruise ship wake, do you have any suggestions or any common things that you see happening that people just have, they should really be aware. So that, like, is there anything you want to kind of message you want to deliver? Definitely. I, yeah. I think we could speak about this for a long time, but if there was <laughs> one thing um, to say is no, before you go, be, be aware of what's moving in the port. Yeah. Uh, and if you, if you don't have the means to do that, stay out of the areas such as the first narrows or the second narrows where uh, vessel traffic is really confined in their ability uh, to, to maneuver. They don't have a lot of leeway to, um, uh, to, to avoid a collision with you. So make sure you're av avoiding that and, and putting yourself in the safest place possible. There's lots of places in Vancouver to enjoy the water uh, where you're out of the way of recreational traffic. So if you are inexperienced and whatnot or, or uh, perhaps not as confident as other users, maybe just avoid those areas altogether. Yeah, I think it's common sense. If the boat is like uh, 14,000 times bigger than you, yeah. probably best <laughs> to just stay out of the way. That's right. <laughs> Well, this has been great. John, uh, Sean Baxter, you're the uh, manager of Marine Operations and Assistant Harbor Master. 
I really appreciate you coming today. This has been an enlightening conversation about the Vancouver Port Authority. Oh, I didn't ask you as well, and I don't know if you know this number, but how many employees are there in the Vancouver Port Authority? Any idea? Uh, there's roughly 350 employees at the port. Yeah. Uh, across a wide range of disciplines. Um, and uh, yeah, that, it's a great team yeah. to be a part of. Yeah, great. Well, thanks for coming in today. Uh, you know, Best of luck with the continued expansion of the port. I think you guys are probably always being pressed to... Uh, I mean, it's probably growing at a, a rate that uh, is challenging for you guys. And I have to say myself, someone who gets to enjoy these waters myself, I think you guys are doing a great job and, and uh, best of luck in the future. Thank you very much for having me. All right, Sean Baxter, thanks yeah. very much. Thank you, man. It's great. I appreciate it. Yeah.